Thank you to the uh, group for leading us and reminding us that we need God every hour, every day. Our guest speaker got snowed in this morning. Um, so I'm going to invite you to turn your thoughts back to the Gospel of Mark, at least for a short time this morning. Last time that I spoke on Mark, it was Jesus and his disciples, and Mark seems to give the disciples a bit of a bad grade. Those 12, at least, that Jesus chose as the apostles who were going to be close to him. Mark keeps describing them as being faithless or dull or slow to understand, and sometimes Jesus seems to be frustrated with them. So anyway, we talked about that a little bit last time. How come Mark describes them that way, but then also how Mark describes Jesus as someone who is willing to work with people who don't always get it, like us. Today, I'm going to be going to Mark chapter 7, and if you have your Bibles, it would be great if you'd follow along. The theme is barriers or divisions that existed in that society. And again, I'm leaning on the commentary that Tim Geddert wrote on the book of Mark. Barriers in society, there were barriers in society, then there are barriers and boundaries in society now. In the business world, we talk about the glass ceiling. You're familiar with the term glass ceiling. Um, usually used to describe the level to which a female business executive or someone from a, some kind of a minority group they can only rise so high in the business world. They can't go higher because of either gender or uh, racial background or something like that. The glass ceiling, it's a boundary, it's a barrier. We like to think there's no barriers for us. We like to think we can be and do anything we set our minds towards. And we tell our children, you can be anything you want to be. And our teachers tell our students, you can be anything you want to be. But it doesn't always feel that way. Sometimes it feels like there are barriers. Uh, Jesus and his society in his day had, he was, Jesus was aware of the barriers. The people who lived there were certainly aware of the barriers. One example in Luke chapter 10, this isn't part of the text, but in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. That's, how we, that's what we call it. It was a man who was on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. The people who listened to Jesus tell the story, they knew that road. They knew it wasn't probably very smart to tra travel that road alone. It was dangerous. The man was attacked. Jesus' listeners figured, yeah, of course he was. He was attacked by robbers who beat him nearly to death and robbed him. And the listeners could picture that as well. And then Jesus, because this is a parable, and he can put anybody in the story he wants, and his parables always had a message behind him. So first of all, he, um, Jesus says, so this priest, I think that was the first one, comes by sees this person who might be alive, might be dead, lying there, and the priest looks at him and walks around because, again, his listeners would understand, if the priest touches that person and the person actually ends up being dead, then the priest is defiled for a period of time and he can't go do the thing that he was going to do. So the priest avoids and walks on. The next, he has a Levite, also one of the respected people, Priests and Levites were up there in their society. The Levite comes along and probably for the same reason takes a good look, walks by, and leaves this person, whether he's alive or dead, they still don't know. 
And then Jesus says, so then the next, there was a Samaritan. And I don't know what the listeners would have said or thought. Like, come on, a Samaritan? Because Samaritans were people who knew about barriers. The priests and the Levites could be anywhere they wanted to be. They had status. The Samaritan did not. It was almost the lowest you could be in that culture. And there were a lot of things the Samaritan could not do. There were barriers for them. The Samaritan turns out to be the good guy in the story. Jesus intentionally messes with their idea of who would be the good guy and who would be the bad guy. But it's a story that, besides other things, teaches a little bit about barriers. Today in Mark 7, there's 37 verses in them. I'm not going to read them all, but I will read some of them. Mark chapter 7, among other things, talks about barriers. So we're going to start reading chapter 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. And then, at least my NIV has in brackets, Mark gives this explanation. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. That's as far as the brackets goes. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? So Mark starts out here by describing, well, first of all, he starts out with Pharisees and teachers of the law. They hadn't showed up in the story since chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 4, 5, and 6, Jesus' ministry was just going up and up and up. It was... You know, in chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000 people. and They were ready to crown him king, and everything was just going forward. And then he finishes chapter 6 by walking on the water and healing more people. And now the Pharisees are back. If this was set to music, the music would change now. It would become somehow more ominous. And they basically point out, how come your followers, your disciples, don't wash their hands? Everybody knows you're supposed to wash your hands. Their point is that the disciples were disobeying the laws of cleanliness. You wonder why didn't Mark put that verse 3 and 4 in brackets? I think it's because he was writing not to people who lived right there, right then. As I've said earlier, he wrote this probably 40 years after Jesus died and rose again and went to heaven. People across Asia Minor and Europe were believing in Jesus by then. Lots of people who had no familiarity with Jewish customs, or at least not much, Paul had, before this was written, much, much earlier, Paul had a number of confrontations, one of them with Peter, the disciple himself. You can't force Gentile believers to obey Jewish laws. You can't create that barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles. We are all believers in Christ, no matter what our background is. So Mark is writing to people who they didn't all understand what the customs had been. So that's why the brackets, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands and all of verse 3 and 4 there. 
by the way, that part was not written in the law of Moses. Moses didn't say that you have to do it, that everybody has to wash their hands. He said priests and their families have to wash their hands before eating certain ceremonial food. Somewhere along the way, somebody who wanted to crank everything up a notch and make everybody a little either better or just a little more bound by rules. Somewhere, somebody said, we should make this a rule for everybody. At least everybody who really wants to show that they are following God. So it became a tradition. That's why Mark says at the end of verse 3, holding to the tradition of the elders, not holding to the law of Moses. So they've come to Jesus and said, how come your disciples are doing it wrong? Jesus says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, They're, but uh, their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Those were traditions passed down People had added those to the laws of Moses. And Jesus points that out. And he says, take a look at yourselves. Verse 9. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. Just a little explanation there. They had devised this rule that if, okay, Moses said, look after your parents. When they are older, It is your duty to look after them, to provide for them. Somewhere along the way, the Jewish people had said, however, if young man X, who has lots of money and should be looking after his mom and dad, who are by now getting on in years, if he says, actually, my money is devoted to God, It doesn't mean he had to give it to God. He he didn't have to give it to the temple. He just had to basically say, it's all now in a trust fund for God. He could still use it. But then he was released from the duty of looking after his parents. So Jesus says, you're criticizing my disciples for not washing their hands. You've invented a different rule that is a whole lot worse. And we could go on with that. Jesus is basically saying, you're trying to set a barrier between the good people and the bad people. You've taken the disciples here and pointed out they're not washing their hands. Therefore, they are down there. You have created your own rules, but you say you're up here. You've created a barrier that has to do with religious observances. So then Jesus goes on in verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. This barrier of clean and unclean, of those who obey and those who disobey, Jesus says actually that all means nothing. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. 
And then Mark adds again in brackets, and I'm assuming this is for the benefit of the people who were reading this in different parts of the world. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. So believers in Athens, in Ephesus, in Galatia, in Rome would say, okay, so we don't have to follow those Jewish traditions because some would still be puzzling over that at that point in time. He went on, verse 20, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So Jesus has talked about this barrier that they have created about those who follow the religious rules and those who don't. Then Mark adds the next story. And again, like I said before, the way he puts stories together, the connection, this first this, then this, then this, it matters. Jesus left that place, verse 24, and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He left the Jewish territories. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. Sounds like he's trying to go on a retreat. I need a break. But he couldn't do it. Verse 25, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria and Phoenicia. She had everything going against her from the Jews' point of view. We're talking about barriers, she was absolutely on the wrong side of the tracks. First, she was a female. Second, she was a Greek. And third, she was born in Syrian Phoenicia. Any good Jew would have nothing to do with her. Barriers. First, let the children eat all they want, Jesus, or he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. And I really have a hard time picturing Jesus saying this. But then again, I would like to see the look on his face when he said it. Was he really saying anybody who's not a Jew is no better than a dog? Or was he trying to see what she would say because she already knew that that's what Jews thought of her? She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Barriers. A woman who was a Greek, who was born in Syria and Phoenicia, asked Jesus for help. And Jesus said, I actually come for the Jews And she said, I know, but surely there's enough left over for me. I know I said earlier, it sounded like Jesus was going on a retreat. He needed a break. You know how sometimes an event or a contact with a person can refresh you in a way that a week of time off can't? My guess The fact that this woman had this kind of faith, 28, yes, Lord. Here's a Greek, a woman, born in Syria. She didn't know about the Jews and their rules, or maybe she did, I don't know. But she wasn't part of that world. Yes, Lord, she replied. She believed him. She believed in him. She called him Lord. And she said, surely there's enough on your table that even those of us who don't belong at the table can still get some of the leftovers. And I like to think that Jesus, in hearing this response, that's the refreshing he needed. Here's faith. Here's somebody who really trusts, who really believes, and he says, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And then one more story out of chapter 7. 
Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. If you look on the map from Tyre, you kind of go to the Sea of Galilee and then you go around on the east side of the Sea of Galilee and down the east side of the Jordan River. There is a region, the Decapolis or the Ten Towns. Again, not in Jewish territory. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After, they, after he took him aside, and he goes on and describes how Jesus healed this man who was deaf and couldn't talk. Not a Jewish man, likely. He was not in Jewish territory. He was out of that region. Mark is telling these stories tied up like that, one after the other in that sequence, because he wants to tell us that Jesus did not believe in keeping barriers between religious practices or social groups or geographical groups. Jesus was about breaking down barriers. Jesus was about inviting anyone and everyone to come to him. And as Mark tells these stories, you can kind of see that theme unfolding. We have barriers in our world. We look at people and we say, well, that person, yeah, that's a person I'd like to get to know. Or that's a person, no, I don't really need to get to know that person. And we base that on all kinds of different things, just as they did. I remember years ago asking God to show me somebody that I could reach out to, someone on a personal level that I could witness to. And then I was in Hague and I saw this person and felt like God was saying, sure, that one. I figured, you got to be kidding. Really? Come on, pick me a better one. It was me showing myself about my own prejudices. It was not not a good example of my own Christian character. I did talk to him. He did start coming to church, etc., etc. But we have barriers. We look at other people and we may say, well, we're not like them. But maybe we are. Jesus came to break down barriers between us. And I pray that God may guide us. That we'll not allow barriers to stop us from reaching out to other people. Let's pray and you guys can come on back up. Father, thank you for the words of Jesus. He came to break down the barriers that separate people from each other and he came to break down the barriers that separate people from your kingdom. Help us, Father, to recognize that and to walk through our own barriers. May your spirit guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.